called Plasticity. Again, from chapter nine, childhood chapter of A Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. Childhood, <clears throat> excuse me, hold on. <clears throat> childhood, and by extension parenting, is an interplay of love and release, of holding someone close while also giving them freedom to explore, even perhaps to leave. In biology, we speak of plasticity, often phenotypic plasticity, to refer to the many outcomes that are possible from the same starting materials. Roughly speaking, a genotype, say the alleles for brown eyes, produces a phenotype, the actual brown eyes. Phenotype is the observable form of an organism. For many traits, though, a particular genotype encodes information for a range of possible phenotypes, and interactions with the molecular, cellular, gestational, and external environment determine what phenotype will actually be produced. Phenotypic plasticity allows individuals to respond in real time to changing environments, to avoid being canalized into set patterns and lifeways by their genes. The skulls of dominant wild hyenas are big and robust, with large sagittal crests on top and broad zygomatic arches of their cheeks. Both of these structures provide places for muscles to attach, much needed if you're in the business of asserting your dominance with your teeth. Compare this to the skulls of hyenas born and raised in captivity, which have no such structures. The different environments of wild versus captive hy hyenas affect what form or morph they have. In the same vein, human children who chew soft processed foods have smaller faces as adults than those who grew up chewing hard, tough food. Spadefoot tadpoles can grow slowly into omnivorous morphs, or if they are tightly packed and running out of time and space in the ephemeral pools in which they live, they can grow more quickly into larger, fiercer cannibal morphs and feed on each other. What morph a spadefoot tadpole develops into is entirely context dependent. When temperatures soar, zebra finches communicate this to their unhatched chicks. Zebra finch chicks, whose parents told them about high temperatures while they were still in their eggs, alter their begging behavior as nestlings, and when they become adults, they prefer hotter nest sites. Even our critically important aortic arch, the first arterial branch off the heart that takes oxygenated blood to the body, has several common anatomies within human populations, which can develop from highly similar genetic starting gates. Plasticity provides the possibility of alternate phenotypes, often through simple rules that do not prescribe precise outcomes. The result, ever more so with increasing levels of complexity, is exploration of new territory, literal and metaphorical. One place that plasticity manifests in humans is the wide variety of approaches to parenting across cultures. In Tajikistan, babies and toddlers are restrained for hours on end in cradles known as gavoras. Gavoras are treasured within families and passed down between generations. Tajik children are the center of family life. Mothers, grandmothers, aunts, and neighbors are always available and immediately respond to cries from a cradle baby with food, singing, or other comfort. Counter to Western expectations, though, within a few weeks of babies being born, they are placed in gavoras, provided funnels and holes through which to pee and poop, and their legs and torsos are tightly bound. Children thus cradled can move their heads but little else. These children, with little experience crawling or attempting to walk in their infancy, do not walk as early as children raised in the West. The World Health Organization's formal expectations for when children start to walk are between 8 and 18 months, and yet Tajik children may not walk until 2 or 3 years of age. Are the Tajik babies dullards or physically incompetent? No. In contrast, children in a rural Kenyan village sit and walk earlier than Western babies tend to. Are the Kenyan babies inherently designed for greatness, their precocious motor skills predictive of early mastery across domains? Also no. Variations in baby raising culture across humans exemplify some of the great plasticity that humans have. Kenyan babies walk earlier than Western babies, but all but the most severely disabled Western babies learn to walk soon enough. Weird parents are not just focused on our children, we are focused on the metrics that are easily recorded and conveyed to others, the when of our child's first smile, word, or step. Once we have such metrics in hand, we are easily confused into imagining that the when is a critical measure not just of health, but of future capacity. Once again, the easily measured thing, the calorie, the size, the date, becomes an inaccurate stand-in for a larger analysis of the health of the system. By believing the false notion that when a benchmark is met is the salient measure of health and progress, we play into our modern fear of risk. It is risky for my child to miss a benchmark. It is risky for me not to force my child to meet arbitrary deadlines. Such parental focus can instill fear in our children, which they carry forward as an aversion to risk. So important. Um, if you don't learn to manage risk as a child, you won't be able to manage it as an adult and you're very likely to, um, run afoul of the 
full adult scale hazards. Yeah. And so maybe that's, um, that then, unless you had something right away is a good way to segue into talking about America's worst mom. Wow. I know she's a friend of ours, you know, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Lenore Skenazy. Wow. America's oh, right. Worst mom. Yes. Yep. 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 Mm-hmm. So for those of you who don't know, um, the second edition of her book, free range kids is just out. Um, and it's fabulous. Um, Except, wait, what what business does she have talking about childhood? She's America's worst mom. Yes. Uh, how'd she get that description? What her, earned her that delightful title? In 2008, so she's a New Yorker. She lives in New York City. Um, in 2008, she let her then nine-year-old son find his way home alone on the New York City subway. He had been begging her to let him do it. She did. From the article that she wrote, which we'll post in the show notes uh, in the New York Sun, quote, long story short, my son got home ecstatic with independence. But of course, the uproar was immediate and fierce. How could she have let her precious cargo loose in the terrible hostile environment that is the a, a modern American city? And in you know, in part, her position is um, the city is supposedly safer than it's been since the '60s. Like you know, we've 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 gotten better, but you know, more to the point. The, the safetyism, which is something that she talks about and Jonathan Haidt talks about, and indeed the two of them together, along with um, an excellent psychologist named Peter Gray and also Daniel Shookman, former chairman of FIRE, started an organization called Let Grow, which is specifically about creating children who uh, enjoy risk and have independence and are anti-fragile. Um, and Lenore, who's a friend of ours, uh, is an advocate for safe and independent um childhood responsibility. Um, and just think about in light of, oh, I'll show this later, but um, in light of that story about what's going on in Tajikistan and what's going on in a rural Kenyan village, the the variety of approaches to parenthood in functioning cultures. You know, we're not talking about outliers and psychopaths within cultures who are abusers and frankly evil. That's not who we're talking about. We're talking about other cultures in which children grow up to be adults who are functioning and productive that do things so differently from how we do them. And yet when American adults stray from, you know, when weird, you know, when Western educated and uh, industrialized, rich, democratic um, people in, in countries that, that that describes do things that go outside of the current mores of sort of safetyism and protectionism and um, always looking over the shoulder of children and informing them what they should do and telling them what the rules are and making sure they don't stray. Um, when, when we go outside of that, we are told that we're putting our children at risk. And you know this this requires a bigger conversation about risk, which we will I think start today. And I mean we've been talking about, but uh, maybe we will be talking about for for some time. But the idea that individual level risk is the only risk that should be thought about and that should be um, should be responded to because it's the easiest to measure, as opposed to creating a society of people who are incapable of doing the analytics themselves and taking and taking responsibility for their own risks such that you then have a society level problem a society level pathology really in which people aren't capable of figuring out what is true for themselves well i do think uh in the interest of balance we should point out that there is some evidence that a relaxed parenting style can lead to moderate to severe cases of heterodoxy mm. and you know mm-hmm. there's no telling where that goes but um yeah. So the other thing is, in some sense, I mean, here's the really uncomfortable part of this. There is no, there's literally no way to raise your children so that they are safe and are capable of managing risk as adults. The yeah. way you learn to manage risk is through things not going completely well and adjusting. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you, you manage risk, compl- you, you, you take all risk out of a childhood and you end up with a person in an 18 year old body with the brain of a child. And how is it that they're going to continue? Like, how is it they're going to become adults? It's well, ever harder. Plasticity does get less and less acute the longer it go, you, you develop. Right. In fact, what you will get is colleges full of children demanding that the world be made safe around them. Right. Right. Which, you know, I know that sounds far fetched, but it could happen. Yeah. Um, but so in some sense, what we're saying is that, um, if you keep your kids 
safe that you are putting the adults they will grow into at risk, right? That's the counterintuitive yeah. point, right? Well, and, and but not just that. If you keep your children safe, you're putting the adults that they will grow into at risk. They will be less competent, less productive, more fragile, uh, less capable in all realms. And furthermore, and some parents will say, not my responsibility, but furthermore, you are putting the society into which you are moving them at great risk. So you are also taking, you are also creating a cost that all of us bear um, by creating fragile children. And are they, do they have a higher chance of surviving to their 18th birthday if you put them in a bubble for those first 18 years? Yes, they do. Is that 18-year-old someone who is going to surprise you, going to be creative, going to be productive, going to be analytically insightful, going to be industrious, going to be capable? No. No. But they're going to be alive. So, you know, which which of these things do 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 you treasure more? Obviously, we want our children to be alive. But at the cost of everything else, everything else, a guarantee almost a guarantee that by bubbling them up for the first 18 years, they will survive. And then what? Then you have a perennial child. And then you have a society full of perennial children. Right. And, you know, I think many of us have happened on this realization from different paths. I mean, this is not so different. I mean, it's not at all different, really, from Jordan Peterson suggesting that you not interrupt children while they're skateboarding. Sure. Right. It's Mm -hmm. the same thing. And Mm -hmm. the point is, is skateboarding safe? Nope. But it is a good way to break your arm and learn the lesson of how one breaks their arm while you're young. Yeah. And, you is know. this safe? Zach, you want to show this? <laughs> right. This is a, this is a, so for those listening, this is a picture of our then, our then eight-year-old son, Toby, uh, jumping off the fallen, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the root mass of a, of a big leaf maple that had fallen in an ice storm the year or two before. Um, it's, it's quite a ways down and he's jumping into a mixture of Salal and Oregon grape, mostly not Oregon grape, although I see some of it there, Oregon grape being somewhat spiny. Um, and he did it over and over and over again. And so did the dog. And so did Zach. And this just is the picture that I, I found, you know, is, could he break a leg? He could. Could he break his skull open? He could. This isn't where you start. You don't start by jumping off the highest thing into an uneven surface. You learn to fall. You, you, you figure out how to deal with your environment in small steps such that by the time you're eight, you can do this. And by the time you're 18, you can do more. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in fact, we are, of course, wired for these things. Um, I have hypothesized that we have many weird characteristics, uh, lowercase weird, not weird country <laughs> characteristics, but yeah. weird characteristics designed to train us to protect things that matter, right? And my guess... The prediction of the model is that um, you get hit in the testicles more when you're young, right? And that I didn't. No, I'm sure (laughs) sure you didn't. But those of us who did, Mm -hmm. right? It's a very profound experience. And the point is, anything that you do that results in a likelihood of that leaves a very clear imprint on you, and it trains you without anybody having to wag a finger. Right? You Mm -hmm. you understand exactly what the problem is, and you just learn not to get hit in the nuts. And um, yeah, I mean, it's it's the difference between knowledge gained by embodiment and experience as opposed to being told. You know, like, dude, play better tennis. (laughs) Cool, done. Okay, (laughs) if it were that easy, which it's not. And somehow, in this incredibly abstract unfortunately a far too postmodern world in which so many of the people engaging even those who say they've they've seen the flaws of postmodernism and are not going to engage in it anymore so many people are operating in an entirely social landscape like making arguments that are about sociality as opposed about social implications and what other people say and what other people think as opposed to what is true like what what actually is true and the way you know that best is by physically engaging the truth of whatever it is that you're trying to physically engage. Well, I do think physically is the way you learn all of these basic lessons. And then there's a way to extrapolate so you can learn lessons that you can't possibly afford to learn yourself, yeah. which um, I know it's become a joke in our family, but um, I am quite a big fan of the subreddit, What Could Go Wrong? <laughs> Uh, Because a lot of things can go wrong. And the most interesting things on what could go wrong are the things that go wrong repeatedly that you don't think are likely to happen at all, right? Those are very fascinating things. And um, anyway, it does (laughs) cause... (laughs) So so the point is... And bonus, you get ads for divorce lawyers when you're looking at what could go wrong. (laughs) 
Actually, I did not. I did not think about whether or not I was browsing what could go wrong when the divorce lawyer ad came up. But, um, but anyway, yes, learn, there's a bunch of stuff you can learn yourself, and nobody has to tell you, "Hey, don't get hit in the nuts again, right? Don't get hit in the nuts again." Nobody needs to say it, right? Also, hey, uh, try not things to you hit, don't need school for, right? Try <laughs> not to hit your funny bone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, got it. Yeah. All right, right. And there's a very good reason. You know, most people don't realize that there's a good reason for the funny bone thing, and it has to do with what happens to the nerves that operate yeah. your very yeah. important hands as they pass through a joint that can't allow those nerves to be protected by all the outer stuff. And so, you know, bumping your funny bone is a warning. Hey, if you keep doing that, you're going to lose use of your hand. Yeah. Right. So anyway. Um, if you insulate your children from the things that will cause them to get hit in the nuts, they might get hit in the, in the nuts as an adult, yes. which is a bad thing. 